was a region within the land purchased by the United States from France. Renamed for the indigenous peoples who were forced here from their homelands. This was Indian Territory. The Indian Removal Act of 1830, under the administration of President Andrew Jackson, forcefully removed the five tribes from their established homes, businesses, and communities from the southeastern United States into Indian Territory. The Chickasaw lost everything, their farms, their burial grounds, their crops and their fields, everything they'd accomplished, their institutions that they had built, all were lost. Chickasaws realized they needed to negotiate the removal process in order to protect their people and also their future. With heavy hearts and a sadness at leaving their homes behind, they began the journey to Indian Territory. There was a lot of apprehension concerning the unknown, but also there was apprehension concerning the removal itself. The death of loved ones due to harsh conditions and disease and the loss of supplies added to the hardship of the journey. However, with an optimistic spirit, the Chickasaw people were determined with every step to make a new home in Indian Territory. Chickasaws had established strong communities back in their homeland in the Southeast. When they arrived into Indian Territory, they were very determined to reestablish those same communities and businesses here in Indian Territory. But the tribes would face new tensions in their new home. The Chickasaws were the last of the five tribes to negotiate their removal into Indian Territory from their homeland. They purchased an interest in land and resources from the Choctaws for $530,000. The Choctaws had mostly settled in the eastern part of their territory, near Fort Towson, while the Chickasaw settled in the western part of the Choctaw Nation, near the 98th Meridian. Here, the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations became the western boundary of Indian Territory, which extended from the Canadian River to the north, the present-day border of Texas to the west, and the Red River to the south. The Chickasaws sold their homes, their possessions, and more than six million acres in order to pay for the expenses of removal to Indian Territory. When they arrived into Indian Territory, they immediately began rebuilding. And as if rebuilding homes, schools, businesses, and communities in their new home wasn't difficult enough, confrontations with Southern Plains tribes, who considered the region their territory, added turmoil and instability to the area. It was just rough country. There were a number of Plains tribes, uh, Kiowa, Comanche, uh, Pawnee. This had been their home for centuries. The Comanches, Kiowas, Plains Apaches were raiding east from their area. They didn't recognize a boundary of the 98th meridian or anything of that nature. To them, it was go to this river, go to that valley, go where these people are, where the horses are. And so there were raids into the Chickasaw Nation. There were also multiple attacks by Texas militia who were retaliating against those same Plains tribes who had been attacking Chickasaws. So Red River, just a short distance, uh, 14, 15 miles from Fort Washita, was an international boundary with the Republic of Texas. There were robbers and cutthroats. In addition, you had unscrupulous intruders coming into the area, as well as traders and trappers, which just added more tension and turmoil for the Chickasaws. Hostile confrontations, theft, tensions were building. And the closest U.S. troops were 80 miles away at Fort Towson. Chickasaws had unsettled scores with some of the Plains tribes due to disputes concerning hunting grounds back in the homeland. Now, with the Chickasaws' relocation to the Western Indians hunting grounds, tribal leaders foresaw conflicts in the new territory. Anticipating the difficulties of moving into Indian Territory, Chickasaw and Choctaw leaders negotiated peacekeeping provisions into the treaties. The first promise was to the Choctaw in their 1830 treaty, Article 11, stating that the United States would provide military posts 
and post roads as needed to help keep the peace. The 1834 treaty with the uh, Chickasaws was negotiated with two primary points in mind, one being that the government would serve as a peacekeeping force in this area. In Article II of the treaty, the United States agreed to defend against any encroachment from any other tribe or settlers in the area. The tribe began pushing hard for the military to step up and enforce their agreement and their treaties to get rid of these what were called intruders. It was not the Chickasaw's intent to move into this new land and have to fight to keep it. It was supposed to be in accordance to the agreement in exchange for their lands in Mississippi. We don't need to go conquer the land. It's supposed to be ready for us. That provision ultimately led to the establishment of Fort Washita. Uh, Colonel Armstrong put in for it to be built west of Fort Towson. Zachary Taylor, which later the 12th president, came down and walked this area out, and he picked this hill. Camp Washita was established in 1836. Colonel George Blake and the 2nd Dragoons came over from Fort Towson, and they started building permanent structures. Fort Washita was established in 1842 on the southwesternmost edge of the American frontier. When it was built, you had the Choctaw Nation East, Chickasaw Nation West, the Republic of Texas just across the Red River. It became a trading center and market for Chickasaw and Choctaw produce, including corn, wheat, oats, rye, and cotton. Its presence and security ushered in accelerated growth and prosperity. So this was the ideal spot. And then through the years, the role it played is just incredible. Depending on when you were here, the fort would look very different because it would go from a small nucleus of temporary structures, logs with bark on them, to more substantial structures with stone foundations. The big barracks were not built until 1849, 1850 first in the South Barracks, and in the West Barracks, the two-story stone, 1854. So the blacksmith shop was absolutely essential. The uh, agency buildings were initially in the north edge of the fort. As the fort evolved, a new hospital was constructed. There was a lot of trade. A lot of stuff came up in Mississippi, then the Red River, and then up the Washita River. Uh, so there was a lot of supplies being brought in. There was blacksmithing and constant construction. It was the hub for a number of years. The Chickasaws and the U.S. soldiers stationed at Fort Washita settled into daily life. As with any military post, it starts off early with reveille and the flag raising and firing the cannon. As far as daily life of the soldier goes, a lot of it was taken up by construction. And depending on the action going on in the area of the fort, and that meant raids, outlaws, intruders, traders, wagon trains passing through, herds of cattle, horses, all had to be dealt with one way or another. On April 12, 1861, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. The Chickasaw Nation found itself in the middle of a civil war that it could not escape. The Chickasaw joined the Confederacy for a variety of reasons. They were linked historically to the South through culture and economics. Their homeland was also located in the Southern states. And their agents at the time of the outbreak were from the South. Douglas Cooper was from Mississippi and he had come with the Chickasaws here. Another reason why the Chickasaws joined the Confederacy, mistrust of the federal government. The whole issue of losing their homelands was still there. Uh, they hadn't forgotten that. There were still wounds that had not healed. Additionally, the federal government wasn't fulfilling its treaty obligations to the Chickasaw people. And Texas across the river, of course, was a threat because it was a Confederate allied state. When the war started and the Union troops come through, if they didn't fight, then the U.S. government would take all their animals, their livestock, their produce, everything, because they had to feed their army. So it's either fight or lose everything you had. In late April 1861, the fort was abandoned by Union troops 
because its proximity to Confederate Texas made it vulnerable. So they started a banding, a federal troops a banding. Immediately, Texas troops started moving in. Fort Washita was occupied by Confederate troops and was used as a headquarters and hospital during the remainder of the war. Most of the buildings were burned after the war. There was no escaping the devastation. When the Confederate troops left the fort in 1865, it was time to rebuild again. Families, communities, businesses, and schools were in need of repair. Chickasaws and other Native American tribes paid a bitter price for their involvement in the war. Their people were scattered. Their homes and businesses were burned. Communities were just ultimately destroyed. An estimated 25% of the Indian population became casualties of battle, disease, and starvation. One of the things I learned when I was a freshman in college, a history professor told me in a Civil War history class, he said, no other state in the entire United States was affected as adversely by the Civil War as was the Indian Territory. And for Chickasaws, the end of the war did not bring an end to the assault on their land in Indian Territory. As a result, uh, the government renegotiated agreements in 1866 following the war, and uh, the tribes lost a lot of rights. They lost a lot of protections in some ways from uh, outsiders. Railroads got the uh, right to come in after that, and so uh, it was the beginning of big changes for the tribes. After the war, the fort was granted to the Chickasaw Nation, and later, the Dawes Commission allotted the fort and surrounding land to the Charles Colbert family. The Colberts rebuilt the original barracks until fire claimed it once again. Fire was an unwelcome yet frequent visitor to the fort. The South Barracks, a reconstruction of an original 1849 post building, had become a beloved and well-used community landmark after the Oklahoma Historical Society took possession of the grounds in 1962. But in the early morning hours of Sunday, September 26, 2010, the South Barracks at Fort Washita Historic Site burned once again. The building and its contents were a total loss. Today, the fort is once again in the hands of the Chickasaw Nation. This place is really, really important to this area, and it's got a real place in people's hearts, and I've seen grown men out there crying when, when the barracks burned. It's just heartbreaking. I guess my one big wish is just go back 150 years and just walk through it one time, because there's structures all over this. We've got 20 or so or 30 identified structures, but we know of over 90 around the site. You can walk through here, and it's almost like you can just feel the things that go on. You walk by the laundry's quarters, and if you look, you see where the water was turned to run in there so they could do the laundry there. And uh, the bake ovens, you can see the burn marks on the walls. And it's just, uh, it, it, it's everywhere you go. I have always felt that in order to know who we are to become, we must know where we came from. We must know who we were in the old days. It represents a grand moment in time, a time when things were converging on this spot, a time when Chickasaws had been moved here for a new start. I think we owe it to the people who come after us to do the best we can to save what we have from the past. This once thriving symbol of both life and death still stands. Time worn with battle scars, but it's still here, much like the Chickasaw Nation. It's surrounded by reminders of the lives lost here and relics of a time long ago when a proud people refused to lose their identity, when they faced unimaginable difficulties and embraced the phrase, unconquered and unconquerable.